Okay. I think we'll go ahead and start. So, hi everyone. My name is Carissa Englert, and I'm an AmeriCorps member serving with Conservation Nebraska's Common Ground Program. I just want to thank you so much for being here and attending our Native Tree Webinar, where we hope to learn um, how to plant and take care of native trees. Here are a couple of reminders before we get started. Everyone is muted and cameras are off, so you won't be seen or heard. But if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, just feel free to type them into the chat box below and we will go ahead and get to them at the end. And this webinar is being recorded, so if you miss anything, it will be um, posted on our Conservation Nebraska YouTube channel in a couple of weeks. And lastly, there will be a short poll that will pop up on your screen with a couple of questions at the end. And these just help Conservation Nebraska to improve future webinars and events. And here with us today is Heather Byers. And Heather is going to share a little bit about herself and her work. And then we will get started with the webinar. So now we will hand over to the expert, Heather, to get us started. Okay, thanks, Carissa. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Heather Byers. My husband, Brian, and I started Great Plains Nursery uh, 15 years ago, shortly after graduating college. Um, we are a native tree nursery. Um, I went to school at UNL for horticulture uh, and really took the perspective of e like kind of an ecological approach when it came to plants. And I just loved plants. I loved being outside. Um, I loved growing plants. And when the more um, entomology classes that I took and ornithology classes, I just really loved how native plants play a role in the whole ecosystem. And there weren't a lot of native plants being offered um, at that time uh, in within the nursery trade. So we kind of saw an opportunity and um, we uh, bought a farm uh, just north of Lincoln. We're near Weston, Nebraska, which is directly between Wahoo and David City, uh, just north of Valparaiso, if anybody kind of knows that area. Um, and we kicked off our business, Great Plains Surgery. So we have a true passion for growing and planting native plants, um, helping landowners, communities um, to add more natives into their spaces and um, kind of just help um, promote our ecosystems, a healthy ecosystem using native plants. So I'm going to get started today. Um, feel free to ask any questions along the way. Um, we'll highlight some natives and just kind of talk about their importance and um, kind of highlight some really good ones that are underutilized and really serve a good purpose within our ecosystems. Let's make sure I get this to work. Okay. So first of all, we all know that trees are essential to our daily life. Um, they provide energy conservation within our communities and our properties. They help with stormwater absorption. They offer us comfort and shade, of course, beauty, uh, which oftentimes can be the key point that maybe that gets prioritized when instead it's some of these other things that um, are not as recognized when it comes to trees. Uh, for sure, mental health benefits. Um, there has been studies showing that just a view of trees from a hospital window can um, lessen the amount of pain medicine needed for a patient and help them to um, to heal faster and be discharged faster. Um, of course, wildlife is extremely dependent upon our trees when it comes to, um, to food sources, uh, nesting, habitat, all those important things. And then of course, there's food and lumber for us as well. Unfortunately though, we are losing our big trees within our communities. Um, just since the 1960s, 30 to 50% of canopy has been lost in our, in our established neighborhoods. Um, for perfect example is this right here, and this is being shown in many communities across Nebraska right now. Um, we've dealt with the uh, Dutch elm disease, and that's what this photo represents is Dutch elm disease that came through in the 80s, 90s, and wiped out whole streets of our beautiful American elm. And we're getting a second wave of it with our ash trees. Um, with the emerald ash borer. So what this has taught us has really been um, the importance of large maturing shade trees within a community, which often gets overlooked for more ornamental trees, um, but then also highlights how important diversity is within community trees and um, rural trees as well. Trees are in decline. There's things that we can control versus things that we cannot. Uh, many of our natural threats are just outside of our control. 
Um, here in Nebraska, we deal with a lot of extremes. I mean, look at our wind today. It's blowing like the Dickens out there. Um, but we deal with ice and snow load um, and our trees have to be able to deal with that. Um, Emerald ash borer, which is kind of our latest threat. And then the photo there depicts herbicide damage. This is kind of a new threat that um, is really getting focused on in the last couple of years when it comes to kind of the obsession with the lawn and lawn care and uh, just spraying like crazy when trees are very sensitive to that. And they're really starting to show a decline because of repeat application and sensitivity. We used to think it was mostly in the rural areas and it had to do with agriculture, but just recently it's just in the last couple of years, they're really starting to study this. And it's definitely showing up in more of the urban neighborhood areas, which directly correlates to just the lawn and basic lawn care. So definitely things that we need to think about when it comes to tree choices within our communities. We have understood that survival in nature requires genetic diversity and adaptability to these environmental changes. This here shows Dutch elm disease, but pine wilt. We're constantly dealing with pine wilt. Um, we work with a lot of acreage and landowners, and it's just devastating when um, we're working with a couple that might have planted a three-row windbreak of Scott's pine back you know, shortly after being married, they planted three rows of it, and right now they're bulldozing all three rows. And it's just devastating on, a, on an acreage or a farmstead. Um, and so it's really important to talk about diversity when it comes back when they're starting to replant. Um, and then, of course, the emerald ash borer, which we've touched on. So adaptability. So when it comes to choosing trees, we want to choose trees that are adaptable, right? Well, when I, when I think about Nebraska, I mean, we have both extremes, right? Just for an example, I mean, this is the drought of 2012, um, which this map is looking very familiar again, unfortunately. Um, but only three years later in 2015, we had extreme flooding. So it, it is swinging very rapidly. Um, and we need trees that can adapt to this and can with, withhold these things or, um, withstand through these extremes. So another interesting um, topic is the temperature swings that we deal with here in Nebraska. So when I think about the trees that are surviving here, I start to think about the pool of genetics that are withstanding some of these extremes, these extremes weather events. Um, but temperature extremes is honestly what can get us. Um, you know, when we look at zone, uh, hardiness zones, when it comes to choosing the right trees, you think, well, we just need hardy to zone four or five, right? Well, not necessarily because yes, north of us, a South Dakota source might be cold hardy, but how about our swings, our 60 degree swings um, that can happen in 48 hours? This example here is from 2012. In February, if you remember last winter, the roller coaster ride that we had when it came to temperatures, um, that can be really tough on trees, especially maples, any of the thin bark trees. Um, you know, February 15th, it was 65, followed by 15 degrees two days later. And that that's tough. It's a tough place to live. Um, I think I find this super interesting. If anybody's ever heard of a heat burst before, um, this, uh, if you pay attention really closely here, look at the Grand Island Airport, 73 degrees at 3 a.m. I'm gonna round up just for sake here, at 3 a.m. And within two hours later, it was 99 degrees. And note, it's at 5 a.m., which is before the sun came up. But, just fascinating. I, I think weather is fascinating. So, uh, but man, that's hard on plants. Uh, so there are many things that we can control when it comes to taking care of our community trees and our, um, our uh, acreage trees. We can start by reducing the harm that we cause them. We, we're so eager to take care of trees that oftentimes we do more harm than good. Um, it, first of all, we need to start with proper species selection proper siting and design, putting the right tree in the right place, proper nursery stock, planting, um, proper pruning and care, lawn related. This is kind of where this obsession comes in with the mowers and the weed trimmers, um, just buzzing right around the base of that tree. And so many times I've seen failure of trees just because the mower just constantly nicked at the base of the tree. 
And that just keeps cutting into the vascular tissue, which restricts all water and nutrient movement within the tree. And it's a very slow death for that tree, which is really too bad. The cuts that you see here on this tree, I mean, there was all good intention here, of course, right? Well, unfortunately, it's cut way too deep and right into the uh, tissue that can seal over that wound is already removed by cutting flush, a flush cut there on the trunk. And that will cause decay and eventually a, um, result in a chainsaw taking down the tree, unfortunately, just because of a, a poor pruning cut. So it's really important to understand trees and how to take care of them to best serve them and um, essentially get them to the next generation, right? Isn't that the point? Get them to the next generation. Um, our soils are definitely a cause of concern when it comes to compacted soils um, by heavy equipment, you know, in a new construction site, um, all things that we need to consider for, um, for growing good, healthy trees and vandalism and mistreatment. Um, I've seen, oftentimes we've worked with so many um, good intentions on a new park planting just to have them vandalized and broken off, uh, which can be really discouraging. And of course, the herbicide damage that we talked about. All right, so when it comes to diversity, how many autumn blaze maples and cattle repairs do we really need, right? Um, don't get me wrong, these are gorgeous trees. I completely agree. Uh, autumn blaze maples are tough. They are as tough as it gets and they are stunning in the fall. I get that, but they're overplanted. Because of that, because of their beauty and toughness, they are everywhere and they are overplanted and they are the next Achilles heel when it comes to our next problem that we're, that most likely is going to come in and be able to just explode throughout a community or um, a rural area. And when it comes to the calorie pears, they've actually been uh, put on the do not plant list, the invasive species list. Um, in the state of Missouri, for example, I got an email a couple of weeks ago that um, there's a group there that if you take a photo of your cut down calorie pear and go turn it in, they will hand you a free native tree to plant in its replacement. So I find that interesting that that is um, the demise of some of our natural areas is these calorie pears taking over. And when they regrow, unfortunately, they've got thorns on them that are two inches thick and mean as all get out and they can take over a wild area very quickly. So um, definitely two to be very concerned about, but two that we see a lot of when it comes to community trees. So how can we get long lived community trees? We need good species selection. We need a broad diversity of species and age. So when it comes to, when you're thinking about species diversity and you might think, oh, well, I planted six different oaks. Well, they're all oaks. So they're all in the same genus of Quercus. So you have to really consider spacing out or dividing up the genuses within a community to make sure you've got elm, um, Kentucky coffee tree, oats, you know, you're just really dividing that up so that you don't, you're not too heavy in one genus, which can lend you um, to failure down the road. With definitely an emphasis on shade trees. We see a lot of people that love the ornamental, the beautiful ornamental trees. And don't get me long, wrong, they are gorgeous, but it's the shade trees, the large maturing shade trees that are doing the most work within a community and definitely need more emphasis. Um, good siting and design, planting uh, trees within communities and groups and groupings versus just single trees uh, planted like telephone poles. Um, working on healthy soils using mulch rather than rock. Um, using compost to work into the soil, not just the planting hole, but on a large scale. So you're really improving that the um, soil health and good quality nursery stock to be planted initially and proper planting, using proper planting techniques to make sure you're not planting too deep, too high, um, and um, making sure that uh, you're taking the straps off when they need to, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We're gonna talk about all that kind of stuff here. And then of course, proper care. Um, that first year is really crucial when it comes to good establishment of, of newly planted trees. All right, so why natives? Um, we have seen that our, or the reason why natives are so important is that they've involved in our conditions and they contribute to our local ecosystem. So for example, bur oak is perfect. Bur oak is native, has a native range from Canada to Texas. The trouble is a Texas oak is very different than a North Dakota, South Dakota, or Nebraska oak or bur oak. Um, and you might think, oh, I'm doing good. I'm planting a bur oak. You go to your local 
um, or your um, local big box store. I hate to say local when I use big box store, um, but you go to your box store within your community and buy a bur oak thinking I'm planting an oak. Well, if that oak has a Southern seed source or a Northern seed source or somewhere not you know, within your local ecosystem or your eco range, um, that has a little bit different attributes to it. For one, being hardy, withstanding those temperatures of both cold and hot, but also issues when it comes to what insects can feed on that tree. Um, oaks in general are one of the most important backbone keystone species within a community, an eco region. Um, and if you introduce one that might not be able to be a host plant for the insects that you have, um, you kind of run into um, in the basically butt heads. It just doesn't support the ecosystem that you want to. So, um, so we work really hard to track our eco regions. We track sources. We collect all over the state. We go into Iowa. Trees do not follow our uh, state lines. So it's more of an eco region that we're tracking. Um, we work with a lot of area foresters and landowners to collect seed of big wild native trees that have withstood these conditions um, and are doing really well. So that photo there in the bottom, that's my husband and uh, one of our daughters uh, going out seed collecting. It's one of our favorite times of the year, every fall, going on seed collecting trips. Uh, you can see my son there in the bottom, heading out to a big burrow up there with Brian. Um, but the photo there in the bottom left, uh, that's a stand of Kentucky coffee tree. Um, that's just fascinating. It's here in Saunders County and it has become kind of a thicket of coffee tree. So it's, it's really quite beautiful. And then the photo there in the middle, that's chinkapin oak seed there. All right, so the point of all of this is to use plants, not just for beauty, but for function. There are a lot of things that depend on these plants as we've talked about. Um, oh, excuse me. So we, um, so using plants and thinking about all of the different things that depend on these plants and making sure to add that diversity for those things as well. Um, if, if anybody's familiar with Doug Tallamy, he is, has written the book about this. Like it is, it, if you're into gardening and into plants, this book will change your life. Um, he first came out with bringing nature home. Um, I don't know how many years ago it's been now, but it has a couple different updated versions and he actually, oh, I meant to bring it down here. He just came out with in early April, a kid's version of this book, which I'm so pleased about, but nature bringing home is all about how you can sustain wildlife with native plants in your backyard. Um, he is an entomologist from the East Coast that started studying the decline in insect populations, which in turn, there's always a ripple effect. You know, it's gonna start with insects, uh, a decline in insects and then birds, and you know, it just keeps on going. And it all had to do with the decline of native species, of native plants, because as a nursery industry, we were um, promoting and planting and supplying too many non-natives, too many ornamentals that served no purpose other than beauty within a landscape. And that habitat was disappearing or getting extremely separated to where those species were in extreme decline. Um, so his famous quote is, garden as if life depended on it. And if you have a chance to read these books, I highly recommend it. They are, uh, they really make you change the way you think about gardening. Um, nature's Best Hope is, is kind of a repose to the first uh, book, Bringing Nature Home, which are very easy reads. Um, they're enjoyable, lots of photos, things like that. So they are good reads. Um, and then he's went on to do The Nature of Oaks, where he really focuses on the importance of oaks um, within an eco region as the keystone species. Um, Grow Native it, out of Missouri is a wonderful organization that really focuses on the importance of native trees. Their purpose is very much into the bird, the ornithology uh, realm, and talking about um, they've really done a nice job of promoting more native plants to be planted with specifically homeowners um, that oftentimes there's kind of a gap between our native areas within communities and our naturalized areas that are getting removed either for agriculture or construction, things like that, and are just not getting replanted. So they've done a really nice job to really promote um, the importance of natives and to encourage homeowners to take it into their own hands. So I encourage you to check out that for tons of resources there talking about all the great native things. So let's move into talking specifically about trees. Um, so oaks, in general, we know that oaks are the most important keystone species. 
Um, they support over 500 species of caterpillars. So what that means is, um, I'll give the example of the monarch. A lot of people are familiar with the monarch. They need the milkweed plant to lay their eggs on because that's what the caterpillars can feed on. Um, there are certain caterpillars and species of moss and butterflies that are specific to a type of plant to be able to rear their, um, or for caterpillars to be able to feed on or their larval, um, their larval stage. Um, but when it comes to oaks, oaks are a smorgasbord, a buffet. There is over 500 different species that can lay their eggs on that burrow and survive. So that's why oaks are so important because they're such a wonderful host plant. So if you have oaks and you have caterpillars, you'll have birds because birds need caterpillars to rear their young. They cannot um, feed their young berries or seeds or anything out of the bird feeder, unfortunately. They need caterpillars and worms. Um, so that's why it's so important to offer host plants that are larval hosts. You know, oftentimes we think about everybody loves the birds and they want to feed the birds. They want to support the birds. They don't think about the rearing part of it when it comes to um, little hatchlings and providing food for them. And that's where native plants really come in um, and can be highlighted. So there are two different oak groups. We have the white oak group and the red oak group. Um, white oaks um, can finish out seed in one year, so they produce acorns every year. Whereas red oak groups, it takes acorns two years to develop and mature. Um, these are all the different oaks that we can grow here in eastern Nebraska. As we start to march to the west, um, that list gets a little more narrow when it comes to due to precipitation amounts. Um, so, um, and many of these are either lowland species, highland species, where um, you can really pick out the right species for the right spot. You know, that's where that importance comes in. Oh, I see there's one question here. Oh. Uh, I keep going. Okay. So, keystone species. So, um, if you get a chance, check out Homegrown National Park. Uh, this group organization works directly with Doug Tallamy, who wrote the Bringing Nature Home books. Uh, they use a lot of his work as the background to what they're doing. But you can put in your zip code, and they will tell you the eco region that you are in. And it will highlight your top keystone species for your eco region. Again, this is not does not follow state lines. It's more about regions, um, eco regions of our uh, layout of our geography. Um, and when it comes to it, they play into the migration fact, the birds and the insects that are native to your area. Um, so for us here in the Midwest, for our eco region, uh, our number one is oaks that we've talked about. Number two is cherries. And that is not the table cherries that you might be thinking of. The cherries would be anything within the prunus group, which would be choke cherries, black cherry, which is highlighted there in the top picture. Um, black cherry is a wonderful shade tree, kind of a medium-sized shade tree. Um, it blooms in the spring, so it's wonderful for pollinators. It is number two on our larval host list. Um, and then it offers a very small berry midsummer, so it's excellent for birds um, in that midsummer appetite, you know. So, um, so threefold there when it comes to um, the habitat um, value. Um, other ones would be our native plums. You know, those are important too. Um, so third on the list is our willows. Again, unfortunately, it's not weeping willows that we might think of. This has to do with our native willows, which would be black willow, peach leaf willow, um, sandbar willow. Oh, and one of my favorite little shrubs is a prairie willow. Um, only gets three feet tall, so it's wonderful to be able to add into a landscape, a smaller yard that is really looking to diversify and add these keystone species in, because um, it only gets three feet high, but it still checks the box for the willow genus, so that's wonderful. Um, next up is our birches and then cottonwoods and elms. So all important natives to, to consider. All right, so a couple of great um, oaks in particular to highlight. You know, everybody seems to be familiar with bur oak and red oak uh, and white oak. So a couple maybe more underutilized oaks to consider, I wanted to highlight. Um, number one is chinkapin. This is a great uh, medium-sized oak with a really nice uh, textured leaf. The acorn is super tiny. Um, about the size of your thumb about, um, and blue jays will clean them off. We have a heck of a time trying to collect seed on these guys. 
um, because the Blue Jays just love them. So it's wonderful for habitat when it comes to the acorns, um, but then also it is an extremely drought tolerant tree. Excellent. Um, I've seen them used in downtown kind of those hell strips of radiant heat from concrete and they just do wonderful. So extremely tough. And then again, you're supporting all of those great things um, for the eco region. Uh, next up is shingle oak. Oftentimes people don't understand that this is an oak because of the smooth leaf that it is. Um, this again has really tiny little acorns and, um, and a nice bear. It has a good almost like orangey fall color, like a rusty orange. But one of the great things I like about it is it holds its leaves through the winter. So we use these a lot in windbreaks because it'll offer that, for one, a nesting cover for anything, any of our overwintering birds, but also provides a wind benefit um, for holding onto the leaves all winter long and extremely hardwood. I mean, even as young trees, it really hurts the hand when you're trying to prune them and shape them up. This is some of the hardest wood trees that, that I have worked with. Um, and another factor that I love about it, it does not show herbicide damage uh, as much as some of the other oaks do. So we really like this one for um, when it comes to windbreak use or even in urban settings, um, very underutilized compared to uh, some of our other oaks. So, and very tolerant when it comes to a wide range of speed or of uh, urban conditions and soils and, and just a nice, good, tough tree. All right, next up is the dwarf chinkapin. So we talked about the chinkapin on the last side. This is dwarf, this is a shrubby oak. Um, what I love about this little shrubby oak is it sets seed very early on. It's a tiny acorn again. Um, none of them will hit the ground. You'll have a hard time getting them because the birds will clean them off so well. Um, but I love that it sets seed so early. So it's wonderful for habitat. Um, and then it's a heavy seed bear. So you'll get lots of nuts, lots of um, acorns for wildlife. It only grows to 10 to 15 feet tall. Being a shrubby oak, it can be grown as a multi-stem tree or as a single stem tree for a, maybe in a smaller space where uh, you might need just a 10 to 15 foot size. And this is a great option because then it's providing that, that oak benefit of all the, the benefits of oaks. Um, then we have chestnut oak, which is a large maturing shade tree. This was selected as the 2017 urban tree of the year by the municipal arborist. Um, just because it is so tolerant of tough conditions. It is a, re a ridge top species, meaning that um, it tolerates poor rocky conditions, tough soils, infertile soils, dry conditions, uh, and just does beautiful. It's not heavy on the seed production. Um, it's very light. Again, um, it's a little bit bigger acorn, but there's not very many of them. So that factor kind of drops a little bit, but um, when it comes to being a larval host, it's really important in that factor too. And just a wonderful big shade tree, again, underutilized. All right, this is um, a really cool location down in Southwest Nebraska. Um, this is Burrow Canyon, which is um, about a three acre canyon nestled below the horizon. It is a great mix of bur oak. Uh, there's characteristics of post oak and gamble oak within this uh, canyon. It is on private land and we've worked with a nurseryman down in McCook named Bruce Hoffman. He's a good friend of ours. Um, he works with the landowner there um, because we're looking at how tough this uh, location of plant material is, the genetics within the, this, these plants. It's three different species going on here of hybrids or hybridization. Um, so we collect seed out of this canyon and uh, Bruce named the tree that comes from the seed, uh, the relict oak. So to be called the relict oak, it has to come from this canyon, knowing that it has all full genetic capacity within those three different species mixed together. Um, and the named relict comes from the idea that at one time this canyon has been studied uh, because, I mean, this is southwest Nebraska. There are no trees anywhere. I mean, it's a 45 minute drive from a cook. It is dry and hot and unbearable. And then you fall into this canyon and these trees are healthy and gorgeous and doing so well. And so it's um, just fascinating to see, think how well these have done and how tough the genetics are of this um, ecotype. So, um, so we're working on um, growing and offering these out to um, 
more of kind of an urban space where they would be really tough within a within an urban area. Um, so it's always a fun trip that we take every year to go out to the canyon. But at one time, it's named Relict because they thought that the whole area might have been forested at one time, and this is what's left of that population. So there's some trees dated in here um, around 300 years old. So it, it's just fascinating. It's it's a really beautiful canyon. So other than oaks, we talked a lot about oaks. Um, a few other things rather than oaks um, would be uh, number one, Kentucky coffee tree. That's a wonderful tree uh, when it comes to um, being a extremely unique. It is the only tree within the Gymnocladus genus, Gymnocladus dioecus, and it can be found on every single continent. It has been found or remnants of. Um, so researchers believe that it goes all the way back to when all the continents were joined as one as Pangea. Uh, Kentucky coffee tree existed then. Its main um, uh, predators aren't the right, right word, but the uh, the main animal that feasted upon Kentucky coffee tree was the mastodon, um, which we actually just did a clip on our social uh, network, uh, our social media about Kentucky coffee tree. We went to um, Morrill Hall and uh, talked to it, interviewed one of the researchers there and talked about the connection between Kentucky coffee tree and the mastodons uh, that were found within the Nebraska area. So it's kind of fun. So check that out if you're interested. Um, but other good maples that or maples are another good one that we um, can look at. Box elder is a good native that we have here in more of the wet areas. Uh, sugar maples, excellent tree, wonderful fall color. Ohio buckeye, paper birch. We collect this one up along the Niobrara, so it's um, a true Nebraska native. Um, of course, the pecans and the hickories. We'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, Northern catalpa, wonderful big shade tree, and I'll highlight that one as well. Um, so any of these here are just really wonderful species to add diversity to any property, um, are definitely worthy of consideration. Um, An American elm, that's one to highlight, that um, is being reintroduced. Um, now that Dutch elm disease has kind of taken its toll, uh, researchers have worked to uh, identify pockets of trees that have withstood, withstood Dutch elm disease. So so we're working on one from Hastings campus, college campus in Hastings, Nebraska. Um, it is the true American elm. All the other ones around it have succumbed to the disease. And there is one giant gorgeous tree still standing and in good health. So we are working on uh, collecting seed from that, working with the um, people, the great people there at uh, Hastings College campus uh, to collect and work on that tree along with the Nebraska statewide arboretum. Um, uh, but then American linden, excellent. Um, pollinator when it comes to our native bees, uh, our pollen source. So a lot of just wonderful natives to highlight. Um, one that not many have ever heard of is the ironwood or Ostraya is its uh, genus. Um, this is a typically an under a understory tree found um, kind of tucked underneath in wooded areas has beautiful yellow fall color, kind of a papery leaf to it, but then it gets these really cool hops that hang, they come on midsummer. Um, traditionally speaking, it should be understory and in the shade, but this species here, or this selection specimen, um, is out in full sun in Omaha and, and tough, heavy soils, and it's doing beautifully. So that kind of gets me excited for an, another option for kind of that small to medium size. And then a Kentucky coffee tree, which we kind of pointed at, um, the beautiful flowers on Kentucky coffee tree are very inconspicuous. You won't even know that it's flowering until you hear it flowering because it is absolutely covered with pollinators. Um, just the buzz of what is going on and then you realize it's in the coffee tree and it is just covered in pollinators. It's, it's kind of a cool uh, sense. But the, the beans hang, um, it's named Kentucky coffee tree because as the pioneers moved across, it does have a little bit of a coffee smell to it. No caffeine, of course, but um, that's kind of where that name came from. Um, but the pods hang through the winter, which kind of offer a cool winter interest. Um, and then just drop to the ground about this time of year, really easy to clean up. So really cool kind of pinnate leaves that give it a filtered shade tree. It's just, it's really a quite gorgeous tree. Um, and then we have to highlight the hickories. Um, these are so underutilized, but such wonderful trees when it comes to habitat and beauty. I mean, the, the yellow fall color, the buttery yellow is just stunning. 
Um, there's three different hickories that do really well here in Nebraska, and that would be shellbark, bitternut, and shagbark. The best place to see large, big hickories would be uh, East Campus in Lincoln. Um, you can go, um, there's a whole nut orchard there with a lot of hickories in it. The other one is in Nebraska City. Um, if you visit the cemetery there, they have large, big shagbarks, even within their parks, and they're just gorgeous. They're just stunning. Um, and then Northern Catalpa. This tree, the leaves are dinner size plate leaves, humongous. The flowers come on late May into early June. So it is a deep shade tree, fast growing, extreme tolerant of wet or dry sites, very drought tolerant, but the flowers are gorgeous when they come on. Um, they're very orchid-like. They even have a little bit of a scent to them, just absolutely cover the tree. And this is a large shade tree. So to be flowering is a little um, unusual to be this showy for flowers for that size of a tree. Um, but excellent to use in windbreaks for a large shade tree for your yard. A lot of people don't like the seed pods that come on afterwards, which are those long pods that hang. Um, and those hang on all through the winter. They turn brown and hang through the winter. They end up just dissipating out and, and break apart and off they go. Um, so, it, it, but the flowers make it totally worth it. Uh, the Ohio buckeye, uh, another excellent kind of underutilized species. This can be understory. It tolerates shade really well. If it's really hot and dry um, in July and August, it can tend to scorch uh, in some locations. So this one does have to be sited correctly um, to really maximize its beauty. But the, the Ohio buckeye nut is really a uh, smooth, beautiful little nut that I'm all kids love to play with. They're just fun, but the flowers on them at the end of the panicles are, are quite beautiful. And this is more of a medium-sized tree. And then when it comes to our smaller trees, a great one to highlight is service berry um, for all the great reasons. It's extremely multi-seasonal with the blooms in the spring, the fruit coming on in June. I mean, service berry fruit is so tasty and it starts out red, very beautiful, but also very tasty. Uh, ends up turning like a purpley blue and that's when they're ready. And you'll be lucky if you can beat the robins because they'll clean these off. They know when they're ready before you are and they'll just take care of them, but um, beautiful tree. And then the fall color is a nice red orange um, that um, is just stunning, very showy. These can be grown as either multi-stemmed or single-stemmed. Oh, let's see here. Oh, we can come back to those uh, questions here at the end. I'm just about kind of near in the end here. Um, so a couple other smaller ones um, to highlight that would be, or I shouldn't say smaller, uh, spring highlighting trees or spring bloomers. Whoops, let me go back. Um, pawpaw, uh, we can grow that here in Nebraska on the eastern side of the state. Pawpaw um, fruits are kind of banana-like. They're kind of this long, um, a very tasty fruit, if, if you like that kind of thing. Um, but it is a really unique uh, plant. If you see the dark flower there, um, pawpaws like to colonize. They can be really cool to kind of create. A, it's very slow growing, not aggressive, but it can create a really neat little colony um, of, of a, a very unique plant. Tulip tree is a very large shade tree. Um, the leaves are very unique in themselves, but the flowers truly look like a tulip. Uh, you, that's my daughter's hand there. It's from an example on city campus in Lincoln. And tulip tree can be tricky um, to cite. They're not truly native right here in our pocket. Um, and they're a little bit more south of us. So we are experimenting with bringing them more north, but, um, but a beautiful tree to trial in the right spot. Uh, Eastern redbud, we all love this tree. Um, absolutely stunning. And they're just starting to turn on their show here um, this time of year. And then the service berry we talked about in black cherry, we talked about earlier in the in the talk here. Uh, that's how showy they can be in the spring. And black cherry is more of a medium sized tree. So about 40 feet tall, um, bloom covered in white blooms like that in the spring. Um, and then a really nice orange fall color. Um, it a, a nice dark purple bark. So very ornamental in itself, along with being a great habitat tree. The win-win, right? Um, and then just a couple shrubs to highlight as well. Uh, American elderberry, chokeberries, the currants, spicebush, sand cherries. I mean, all great spring blooming shrubs as well. 
Um, and then I just wanted to highlight kind of windbreaks. Um, we deal a lot with landowners um, restoring windbreaks, um, creating habitat on either their acreage or their um, their land, either for um, hunting purposes or just wanting to create more habitat as it's being broken up by agriculture, um, which I really commend people for, um, for wanting to do that. So a couple options, we kind of take um, a very diverse approach to it when it comes to planting windbreaks because we're looking at the opportunity to add more diversity in and more um, habitat. Um, and this is a great way to do it with also being functional for a property by being a windbreak. So um, here's a good example in the bottom left. Uh, we worked with, um, with Ponderosa pine here, which is a native pine. Um, it's native up to the Pine Ridge, not so much on the Eastern side of the state, but we use it and we, um, we spread it out a little bit more to make sure that we avoid any type of disease pressures. It does not get pine wilt. Um, many people are a little confused by that. Pine wilt is naturally occurring here in Nebraska and the trees that are most affected by pine wilt are European trees that we introduced. So um, our native ponderosa pine is not affected. So we can plant that. Um, so that is a ponderosa pine windbreak along with a swamp white oak planted in the row in front of it. You can see there was just young trees planted in that one um, as a way to kind of spread those out. Then um, Black Hill spruce is a wonderful spruce um, that does really well for us. Um, it's very drought tolerant. Um, and the spruces that we recommend are Black Hills spruce, white spruce, which is a direct cousin to the Black Hills, and Colorado spruce, which Colorado is beautiful with the blue cast. I get that, you know, no arguments there. It is the most commonly planted. So again, looking for diversity, making sure that you're um, really um, being direct when it comes to choosing the right species for your property to make sure you know you're getting that diversity piece in there and not over planting and running into the same issues with the Scots pine that we had or that we're dealing with now. Um, in the bottom one there you can see that's a swamp white oak and a Colorado spruce. The reason we use swamps a lot in uh, windbreaks is because they hold their leaves in the winter. Uh, it's a fast growing oak so uh, spruce in general are slower growing so by adding in shade trees like oaks and swamp white oak is one of the faster ones. It'll get you that height really fast. It'll fill in and um, offer that winter protection because it holds on to its leaves. And also it's a great nesting cover as well. Um, a couple different ways that we approach windbreaks then when it comes to diversity um, is we, we group things together. We make it kind of an aesthetic, um, naturalized planting. So there's a couple different ways you can do that. Um, we'll start kind of here in the top right. You can work by grouping species together. And again, this shows how we use different spruce here. We use white spruce and black hills. We brought in red oaks. So again, we're always kind of looking to make sure we're hitting those keystone species when we're working with a new property um, to kind of check all those boxes. And then we report that to the homeowner of you know, you're creating this wonderful habitat by choosing these species and here's all the benefits that they're supplying. Um, but then we work to bring in some shrubs as well by adding choke cherry that hits the prunus box, uh, the gray dogwood, that is an extremely tough um, native shrub. We didn't even talk about, they're not high on the, the um, keystone species list. They're a little bit lower on the list. They're not in the top five. That would be the cornice group, um, but still very important when it comes to um, the berry set and, um, and great nesting because of the branch patterns. Um, so it offers great protection from those predatory birds. So here's an example down here in the bottom of a, you know, showing the shrub groupings that we did. Here's a Kentucky coffee tree in there. We've got groupings of spruce. So as that's continued to grow up, it's all filled in to be a great screen and windbreak from this busy gravel road. Um, but then tons of interest by adding, you know, with the shrubs give you a lot of that interest with the bloom times, the fruiting, the fall color. So you're getting a lot more than just three rows of evergreens as a windbreak. So um, kind of a fun approach to it. Um, the example up here in the left shows this homeowner really still liked their straight lines, but we are able to offer um, to get more species into this by just doing straight groupings. And again, a great diversity list here using um, black chokeberry, dwarf chinkapin oak, um, the swamp white oak again, and then two different groupings of 
um, of spruce there, of white spruce and black hills, um, to really diversify and thicken up that windbreak for that property. So when it comes to proper planting, it is so important uh, to know the proper steps when planting a tree. First of all, when it comes to digging your hole, um, you wanna really look at the depth of the tree within the container, the growing container it's in, making sure that you find the flare. Um, oftentimes, unfortunately, trees can be planted too deep even within the container coming from the nursery. Um, so uh, you really have to pay close attention to find that flare, that natural flare that comes uh, on the trunk of the tree where the trunk meets the root system. Uh, once you find that and you identify the proper depth, you know, you might have a root ball that, or a container that was 12 inches deep, but once you find the root ball, it's only eight inches deep, or that's all the, the deeper the hole that you need. So when you go to dig your hole, say it's eight inches deep now, you wanna go twice as wide, the same depth that it is at the root flare, or even a hair high, and twice as wide. That enables that loose soil that you backfill to be nice and loose, really easy to root into, um, and just a nice, um, uh, easy space for that for that tree to root into. Um, make sure the bottom of the hole is firm uh, so that you don't wind up sinking down. If you're using an auger, which can work, pay really close attention to depth when it comes to an auger because it can be really easy to lose sight of how deep you're going. And an auger does a really nice job of loosening up the bottom of the hole. And we always see things settle a couple inches down. So that's where uh, sometimes using an auger, you have to backfill quite a bit and then really pack down the bottom of the hole to make sure that that rib ball is going on firm soil. So then you backfill using the same soil that you took out of the hole. If you want to amend, you need to amend at a large scale which means a large area adding uh, new topsoil in or compost in and working it in, um, uh, working it into a larger area. If you make that hole too nice and backfill with really nice topsoil that you bought from the garden center, you just created a container in the ground. And there's no incentive for that tree to root out anywhere else and to really root in and transition into the soil. So it's really important just to backfill with the same soil then you use any extra soil you have, which there will be extra soil, and create a nice donut around the outside, which in turn creates kind of a basin around the outside of the ring of the hole. So it's around the whole perimeter. That helps for any rain um, or watering that'll help fill up that basin and then deep soak that root ball. And it's really important to give it a good soaking. The importance in watering doesn't come from frequency, it comes from amount. So trees need deep watering to water the whole root ball profile and encourage those roots to go out versus constant moisture. It's actually better if they just start to dry out so that those roots are seeking moisture. And then again, that's when you deep water it and really soak it good. So um, after you backfill and add that nice berm around the outside or kind of that donut ring, um, you apply two to three inches of mulch keeping the mulch away from the trunk of the tree. As you can see in the diagram here, the mulch is not piled up next to the tree. It's kept back. Um, this mulch piled up next to the trunk can aid or can be a wonderful spot for decay to start along the base of the trunk, which is not what you want. So it's important to keep that back. Um, and then if it is a large enough tree that needs to be staked, which we don't advise staking all trees, um, our seven gallon and smaller, we usually don't stake on fall plantings, I should say. Spring plantings, because of our storms, we have started staking. Um, like last spring when our winds were just horrific, we staked everything. Because as soon as they would start getting rooted in and it grow new roots, we'd get a wind storm of 60 mile an hour winds and that would all just break off. So we have started staking more than what we probably used to. But what we recommend for staking is two T-posts, uh, just vertical T-posts on the outside of your planting hole. So it's going into firm soil and then using uh, T-straps to um, strap around the base of the tree or around the trunk of the tree. And then just using some wire to secure it to the T-post. It's really important to remove those straps after one year. Um, you do not want the tree getting too dependent on that stake. You actually want it to have a little bit of give. That'll help aid in better rooting as well. If it becomes too dependent on the stakes when you go to take them off, you'll have failure of your tree. 
Plus, if those straps are too tight, it can really start to girdle the trunk of the tree if left on too long. So you need to be cognizant of that as well. Um, and then we are recommending trunk guards. We are seeing a ton of damage the last two winters with rabbit damage. When it comes to trees, we didn't used to do a lot of tree guards, um, but that absolutely finishes a tree off when it gets rabbit girdling around the base of the tree. So um, some species have a thicker bark that rabbits aren't interested in, but the thinner, sweeter bark trees, um, they will go after every winter. So um, we advise putting a trunk guard around the base of the tree, just an open mesh works really nice to allow airflow and sunlight um, and, and does a really nice job. All right. And finally, keeping your trees watered. That is something that sometimes gets overlooked in that first year. Um, a couple great tricks to use. Um, so we recommend uh, one inch of water per week on newly planted trees, with especially important in the first year, sometimes into the second year, like anything right now with the drought conditions we're kind of dealing with now, we're telling people continue your weekly waterings just to help get those trees established through that first year. Um, a good trick is, so one inch of water, which is about five to 10 gallons of water. Um, a nice trick that we learned from a farmer, um, you know, farmers have the best ideas, um, is a five gallon bucket, drilling a hole an inch from the bottom. It takes about one minute to fill that five gallon bucket up but it'll take 20 minutes to drain. And what's important about that is you get this great vertical movement into the root zone versus all watering and then you're getting it having some runoff and it's not all going right into that root zone. Um, so it's important not to rely on your lawn sprinklers. Oftentimes, um, or not oftentimes, always, uh, turf is very, very efficient at sucking up every little bit of moisture that you put down when it comes to your lawn sprinklers. Um, so it's important to um, treat your trees separate from your lawn and go out deep water them. Um, I love using a soaker hose and these are some aspen trees that I have and I just kind of wind it through and I got a little timer. Um, I had to get a little timer after I left my soaker hose on one night and I forgot about it um, and watered a little too much. Uh, so I just got a little timer from Amazon. It was like 20 bucks or something and I'll set it for 30 minutes and then go about doing yard work or making supper or whatever. But I just love moving that, um, that soaker hose around and just really soaking the whole profile underneath my planting beds and my trees. Um, and then another good trick is just a nice slow watering out of a hose. That works great too. Just knowing that you're deep soaking, that you're applying a large amount of water um, and really soaking that root ball is key. All right, and with that, we kind of come to the end here, remembering that native plants are truly the foundation of our ecosystem. And multiple species rely on native plants. It's plants that move the energy from the sun into our um, circle of life, right? All those important things that rely on it. So, um, so I encourage you to consider planting more native plants. And with that, remembering that trees are always for the next generation, right? Not for us. Thank you, Heather. That was a very informative presentation and the uh, slides were beautiful as well. So we really appreciate that. Oh, um, I'll go ahead and start reading some of the questions. Okay. I'm a novice working on bringing a long neglected yard back to life at our new home. There were walnut trees in our north garden they were cut down at some point, but the roots are big and deep and still around. We have tried to get as much of them as we can, but nothing will grow in that soil. Everything shrivels and dies in a matter of days. Will I ever be able to plant another kind of tree in that soil? <laughs> right. So that has to deal with the juglones um, that is actually uh, a chemical that comes out of black walnut trees. Um, you, you can Google juglone. Um, there are some tolerant species to that soil, but it does take time for it to break down. You can bring in new topsoil, you can scrape some out, you can bring some in, some new soil in and start to work it in. Because now that that tree is gone, um, there's nothing feeding those roots. So they are breaking down, but because it was a large tree, it's going to take a while. And it was an old tree. It's going to take a while for those roots to break down. And all of that juglones is just seeping into the soil. So um, so that's what I would recommend is pulling that soil off if you wanna plant there and bring a new soil in, 
or um, using the space as maybe a raised bed space for a while, for a couple of years, adding in some raised beds and um, putting soil into there, um, that would be an option as well. But yes, that is a tough, tough situation. Okay, um, what is the best oak for a smaller yard and caterpillars? Ah, great question. Um, uh, so my first go-to would be a dwarf chinkapin oak. Um, because it's in that 10 to 15 foot range, you can get it as a single stem as a small tree or multi-stemmed, which is a cool effect too. Um, but that's a wonderful small oak. Another medium size would be just the straight chinkapin oak that we talked about. But those are kind of our two smallest oaks that we can plant when it comes to a small yard. Okay. And this is um, Lynn again. Uh, deer destroy everything in our yard. We live near a large park that has an overpopulation of huge deer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, the trick I think would be to fence things off. Um, planting natives would help because deer are, that's not as interesting to them as maybe like hydrangeas are or some of our non-natives. Um, so again, just kind of embracing them, um, enjoying them, um, planting things that maybe just won't be as interesting or as um, delightful, I guess you could say. Okay, um, I understand that black cherry can be a bit weedy making many seedlings. Does that suggest where it should be planted? Yes, it can be. Um, I don't know if I call it weedy. I have a couple planted uh, back kind of in our place and I've never seen seedlings come up yet, um, but we do have grass underneath of it and um, kind of some understory plantings, but I've never seen um, any seedlings come up, not the way like mulberries do or, uh, silver maples, how troublesome those things can be. So I don't know if I quite use that word for it, um, but I'm sure it can uh, seed out. But again, that's just regeneration. Um, so I think there can be a balance there when it comes to what you use as your understory foundation um, for kind of how thick your understory is and if it's conducive for that regeneration, which can be a good thing because it is such an important native um, but if it's not what you want, you know, a weed is only a weed if it's in the wrong spot. So um, that's just kind of that balance that you take when selecting that material. Okay, hey, there's another deer question. How do you keep deer from eating trees? Uh, yes, um, deer can be troublesome. They're very uh, curious creatures. We've seen more trouble when it comes to like windbreak plantings and um, some of the plant material that we use with them actually pulling new plantings out um, of young stuff than more eating. I mean, they'll chew down. And remember plants, well, natives particularly can handle grazing. I mean, that's all part of the ecosystem, right? It's all a balance and things do get out of balance when, when deer don't have a predator. Um, and that's, you know, we've all learned that if you, if you study the Yellowstone example of bringing back the wolves and how overgrazing can deal with um, all kinds of issues from deer. Um, but a good thing would be caging if you have anything new. More troublesome than eating on the on trees is the rubbing. The rubbing can cause significant damage. So um, we encourage any new um, plantings to have caging if you do have a wild, a lot of deer population. I've had a lot of people come back to me, tell me they've used dryer sheets and had really good luck. Um, Irish spring soap, um, just a lot, you know, just those fragrances to keep away from deer, but um, some grazing is okay, and trees will re-sprout even if they were grazed. Um, so it's just kind of finding that balance and, and what works best for you for your area. Okay. And in the chat, we have rabbit damage. Do you recommend to always replace the tree? Uh, it, I would have to see the situation. Most often, yes. If it's girdling along the base, it won't kill, it might not kill it that year because there's always enough energy in the buds of a tree to push out new growth. It's when they need to start pulling energy up the tree, water nutrients that then they dry out and die. Um, and any type of girdling along the trunk of the tree from a rabbit, a weed trimmer, a mower, any of that will end up affecting the movement of water and nutrients within the tree and, and lead to failure, unfortunately. Okay. And we have a comment here. I think NGPC 
Nebraska Game and Parks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we recommends tall tubes to protect from deer and to stake the tubes because deer sometimes lift up the tubes. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, we've seen that. And um, we've experimented some with the tubes. Um, we've seen some bad effects inside the tubes of almost a greenhouse effect where they end up getting really tall and leggy and wimpy and they're not developing caliper, like which is really important for us to develop with our strong winds. So we see those tubes coming off and it just end up being this kind of wimpy, wispy tree. Um, so we've moved away from using any of those tubes and they are effective when it comes to deer. So if that's your main concern is deer, um, then, then that would work. But when it comes to, if the deer population is not a big problem and you're just wanting to establish a really good windbreak and you're needing that good caliper growth, strong, sturdy trees, I would lean more towards the open mesh um, or even wire mesh tubes to help keep the deer off um, as um, a little bit more effective when it comes to that application. We have a comment um, from Steve. Thank you for your dedication to native plants. <laughs> Thanks. I think we all feel that way. You really, we can tell you're very dedicated to native plants. Um, mm -hmm. I want to make sure we're getting all of the questions. I am in a minute going to put up a brief poll. And if you could take time to complete that, it would be very helpful to us in terms of our funding and um, future planning. So Jennifer wants to know, do you have suggestions for smaller pines for a variety of height, especially when paired with the larger Colorado or Black Hills spruce? Or is it more important to consider variety? It is for a windbreak. Sure, yep. So there's um, a couple different pines that we can plant. Ponderosa is our go-to when it comes to a tough pine, and they actually will grow taller than the, any of the spruces. So that's kind of our middle tree when it comes to a windbreak to offer that height for the windbreak. Pines in general are very open and layered looking, uh, when it, like the Ponderosa in general. Um, and so it doesn't provide that density of a spruce will. So, you know, that, that spruce will be kind of that thick wall, whereas the pine will be a little more open and wispy, but give you the height so for the wind to go up and over. Um, we are experimenting with red pine, which comes to us um, a little bit north of us, but tolerates our humidity really well and more moisture for more of the eastern side of the state and into the Iowa region. Um, so red pine is one to experiment with, and I love white pine. White pine is gorgeous. I wouldn't use it in a windbreak ever, ever, ever. Um, it is extremely uh, sensitive to our winter winds and desiccates really easily. The needles don't have a very thick cuticle like the way a ponderosa will where it can tolerate our cold desiccating winds and our winds are so dry in the winter months that it just just dries out that cuticle so quickly and white pine just can't tolerate that and ugh, they just kick the bucket and dry out um, or they end up losing all their needles and they can maybe push out a new bud but um, but they just look rough. So I, I love white pine. It's so soft and gorgeous, but I use it more in a protected site, um, you know, an inside row of maybe a well-established windbreak, but I would still be cautious for any type of wind application. Okay, thank you. Let me, I want to make sure we get all the questions here, I think. Okay in the chat box. Have you seen a big difference in the vigor of trees that have been propagated via cuttings compared to ones grown from seed? I am a student at UNL and have taken a few classes and am recently doing a project with some tree cuttings. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so I prefer seed go grown trees because um, they naturally can form their root system and the trunk of the tree versus cuttings on a tree is you are manipulating a branch of the tree to start rooting. And that works wonderfully with things like willows and um, maples can do that easily. Oaks can't root that way. They just don't work that well. Um, but there are certain species you can do that with. Um, my argument would be um, on the longevity of the structure of that tree when it comes to the root system and I have not seen trees grown from cuttings to develop a very nice flare. They end up just always being telephones because the flare develops where the root system, where the root system meets the stem. So that can naturally develop when you're you grow from seed. Plus the other um, advantage 
of growing from seed is the genetic diversity, which is so important versus clonal, which is basically what you're doing when you're propagating cuttings is you are clonally uh, reproducing that tree, which is not which is great when it comes to choosing an attribute such as color or something like that or shape. Um, but we're more looking towards the longevity and the toughness, the, um, the yeah, all those other kind of ecological things about trees. So that's my perspective. Hey, I think we've answered all of the questions. Um, you, We do have your address and your phone, oh, your phone number here. If yeah, anybody yeah. has additional questions or wants to visit your um, nursery, which I'm sure yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so thank you very much. And thanks, Carissa, for helping out and introducing Heather. Um, I think if anybody has a last minute question, go ahead and put it in. But otherwise, we'll probably end for the night and very informative, interesting presentation. Thanks. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.